Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Speak forth the praises of His glory. Speak forth the praises of His glory. Speak forth the praises of His glory. Speak forth the praises of His glory.
Jesus is mine. He's mine. What a blessed assurance. He does not visit and leave. He's that ever present help in time of need. Terrible scholar. I don't know whether somebody understands this. Jesus is mine. He leadeth me. He clothed me. He ordained me. He sanctified me. He's been made my wisdom. My redemption. My sanctification.
Nobody that understands you like Jesus. Nobody. There are people who might think they understand you, but they don't understand you. There are many people who don't even know a half of your life, but Jesus does. He understands you very well, and He loves you. With an everlasting love. Men are impatient. But Jesus is patient. Men are judgmental. But Jesus is slow. To anger. And rich in mercy. The Bible says he's that ever present help. In time of need. That friend that sticks closer. Than a brother. Jesus knows your every need. He knows your weakness and strength. He knows how you will come out. And you will come out. The Bible says he's able to save to the uttermost. They that come to him. He's able. The Bible says that he that began a good work in you. He'll seek your accomplishment to the day of Christ. Why? He ever lives to make intercession for you. He didn't judge you. He loves you. He made you. The Bible says the spirit of the Lord hath made me. And the breath of the almighty hath given me life. He says there is a spirit in man. And the inspiration of the Lord giveth him understanding. He works in you both to will and to do. According to his good pleasure. Jesus loves you. He's your friend. Come on, somebody, praise your friend. Say some words to your friend. You know, every time I think about how Jesus loves me, tears come to my soul. Unless you don't know Jesus. But when you know Jesus, when you know Jesus, when you understand the love of God that passes all understanding. He says that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That you might have a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. He wants to you to know the depth, the height, the length, the width of his love. He wants you to be perfected in it. He says here his love made perfect that we might have confidence on that day. He says for as he is, so are we in this world. That is the perfection of his love. He wants you to be like him. In everything. There are people who know you because you can explain. When you are out of explanations, they can't know you. But even when you have not yet explained, Jesus knows you. He understands you. He knows how to vindicate his own. The Bible says he has loved me with an everlasting life. An everlasting love.
Are you ready for the word? Praise God. Tonight I'm going to touch a very, very beautiful subject. You're going to love it. I, I call it the joy of your salvation. Somebody say, I have joy. The joy of my salvation. Say it again, I have joy. The joy of my salvation. Somebody say amen. Acts chapter 15 and verses 18. The Bible says, Known unto God are his works from the beginning of the world. Somebody say amen. Known unto God are his works from the beginning of the world. Known unto God are his works from the beginning of the world. What does that mean? Everything the Lord has made, he knows. Somebody say amen. Everything my God has made, he knows. None are the works of God from the beginning of the world. In other words, everything he has created, he knows. Hallelujah. There is nothing you're going to do that is a surprise to God. There is nothing you're planning to do next week that is a surprise to God. Good or bad? He knows. Somebody say amen. You are his works. The Bible says we are God's workmanship in Christ, created in Christ, and two good works. For which were ordained before that we should walk in them. You are the work of the Almighty. And he knows everything that pertains to your life. Somebody say amen. So because none are the ways of God, none are the works of God from the beginning. Nothing you're walking or doing right now that surprises him. Everything you're doing, he knew you were going to do it. Somebody say amen. Wherever you walked, he knew you were going to walk. You coming today, he knew you were supposed to be here. None of you is here by mistake. Even the time you leave is ordained by heaven. Somebody say amen. We live in a very confusing world. And, and tonight I want to touch something very integral on the life eternal. When God created you and I in the earth, you are the earth, you are an idea in the earth, but you have an eternal bearing. And the way eternity relates with the things of life, this life, which you and I have received in God, is different from the way the earth relates with the life of men. Somebody say amen. The earth is too slow for God. Why? Because for you, you're living second by second. The eternal planes of the spirit don't calculate second. Fourth dimension begins from understanding the time of the spirit, not the time of the earth. The timing of the spirit does not respond to the series of the earth. Like some of you say, ta, 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 60 seconds is one minute. 60 minutes is one hour. You understand what I'm saying? 12 plus 12, 24 hours is a day. 30 days is a month. 365 or 64, depending on the leap or whatever it is, that is the series you live. You see what I'm saying? But God doesn't relate with you eternally that way. Let me give you an example. When you look at eternity and the way God has framed it according to the time, the Bible says, having eyes they see not, having ears they hear not, least at any time they should turn and what? Be converted. And the Bible says, and understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. He says, least at any time. When he says least at any time, it means that some of you, the difference between now and tomorrow is what is revealed to your spirit. That means eternally, the time factor responds to knowledge. Knowledge is time in the eternal plane of the spirit. The more you know, the quicker you get results. 
The more you know, the easier you get results. He says, for these people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Least at any time, the Bible says, they have, well, they should what? See with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Praise the Lord Jesus. The earth is waiting for that manifestation of the time dimension, eternal, and that is cling to knowledge. There are things right now that I can release in your spirit by knowledge and they change your life in seconds. There was somebody who came on this ground sick. But in just a couple of minutes, they were healed. There was somebody who came on this ground bound. But in just a couple of minutes, they were set free. They had a choice not to come. They might have not come. Maybe they've carried disease for many years. But today, there was a certain heavenly Revelation that hit their bodies and they were healed. Because of knowledge. In this world you're going to realize the more you know, the easier things are. The more you know, the quicker things are. Somebody say amen. Knowledge is inseparable with time in the eternal things. At least at any time any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their hearts and be converted and I should heal them. You know, every degree of deliverance and grace comes after a conversion. And that conversion because of a certain knowledge. Right now I can share something in a few minutes that can change 10 years to come. 20 I can share something right now. In fact, what I'm going to share tonight is going to change your life forever. Forever. Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. Let me give you an example. You know that the devil succeeds and has succeeded this far because of the ignorance and the things that come in part as knowledge but are not knowledge. Let me give you an example. There's a man walking this life of salvation with a consciousness that they are progressively walking in God as God works in them to do certain things. That is okay. But it is not quite the full knowledge of God. Are you hearing me? Much as that man has at least translated from a man who thinks that he is on his own strength. I don't know if you're following me. There's a man who thinks that he's on his own strength. This one has left his own strength and he has received the strength of the Lord. He's working under the grace of God. He's working under the power of God. But he looks at things, the things of this life, as things to come and a progressive adoption to those things by yielding to God. And that is okay. But it is not quite the fullness of the things of God. This is the fullness. The fullness is when a man arrives to the full consciousness of what God has done in him. Am I making sense? There's a person who is working his own works. And he will receive the reward of a man under the law. There's another one which has embraced grace but progressively yields to the working of God as one in whom God has not finished. And then there's another man who's working from a plane of understanding that God has finished. It is finished. Okay, you've been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the presence of Christ Jesus. Yes, we know that. But to what extent are you conscious by that revelation? Because these two men, besides the third one, are all recipients of the grace of God. But they've received it differently. They've received it differently. They've received it differently. In John, he says, John chapter 1, first uh, John chapter 1, verses 1. First John chapter 1, verses 1. He says, can you get me that? Or should I open my Bible? That 
which was from the beginning. The Bible says, which we have what? Answer me. Which we have? Which we have what? Seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. He says, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. And the next verse says, and verse 4, that which we have seen and had declared we unto you, that you may also, the Bible says, have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with the Son, Jesus. And the fourth verse says, and these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. So you ask, how do these things bring the fullness of joy? When Jesus was praying in the Gospels, he says, my joy I have given them that their joy may be full. When the Bible speaks of joy full, huh? the fullness of joy, the Bible speaks of a joy that does not go away. None of just the degree of the amount of joy on your spirit. Because it can stretch as far as from here up to Mars. But then the next day that joy is lost. Somebody say amen. He's talking of a joy that never leaves. We're talking about fullness of joy. He's talking of a joy that never leaves. That joy is there every day of your life. Until you leave this world. Somebody say amen. amen. Say amen again. Amen. It's called the joy of the Lord. But many Christians, saints which have believed Jesus, some have embraced this joy according to the message of his grace. But some have failed to enter the fullness of this joy. So we write, we teach, we preach unto you that your joy may be full. And there are things in this life, if they're not fully revealed, you will never have the fullness of joy. You'll be happy today and sad tomorrow. You'll be up today and then down tomorrow. You'll be ecstatic today and then the other day you'll slump. You're, you're in and out. You're up and about. You're dancing. In the Lord, and then the next day, too frustrated to even pray, and then you're up and about, and then you think that it is no more. Let me tell you, it's not no more Christianity to be up and about. Some people teach that way, but that's not truth. It doesn't mean that issues won't come. It doesn't mean that troubles won't come. It only means that even when trials come, Paul says, count it all joy. <laughs> He's talking of men who are put in prison and they dance until the doors open. Why? Because they know who they are. He teaches you to dance in the storm. Somebody shout hallelujah. To sing songs of praises even in fire. To go through water and not feel the impact. Why? Because there is a certain fullness. You see, it's like the comforting of the spirit. He says that the Lord may comfort you even as he has comforted us. With the comfort of Jesus. Even as he has comforted us. The, when Paul was speaking of that comfort. He, he was speaking of a certain comfort. And he prays for the church and he tells them, may, that Lord, may the Lord comfort you with the very comfort with which he comforted Christ. And with that same comfort, the Bible says he has comforted us all. There is a certain way God knows how to comfort you in your issue. That is why some of you are going through things and people ask themselves, why is she laughing? Maybe you don't get it. Have you ever been in a situation and somebody asks themselves and they say, what is that to laugh about? She lost her job. Her man walked away. Everything is falling on the other side. But look, she's laughing. Somebody say amen. There is a comfort that comes from God. When a man knows God. When a man has understood the fullness of this joy, nothing takes away your joy. Somebody say amen. Nothing takes away your joy. Nothing takes away your joy. You have to get to a level where nothing, I mean nothing, I don't care what news you've received today or yesterday, nothing should take away your joy. You should not eat the bread of sorrow because of what you're going through. There is a place where you can be shaken, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do, but that is at a certain level. But there's a point where you reach, you see, it's like one time. Some man came and threatened me. 
Many months ago. Years ago. I think last two, three years ago. And this guy threatened me. Oh, you're going to do this to you. Da, 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 da. Then after he threatened me, I told him, look at me in the eyes. And he looked at me. I asked him, do I look afraid? And he didn't answer my question. And I know why he couldn't answer. Some of us have been through too much. We went to hell and back. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do I have a witness? That you've been through too much. That nothing scares you. Things flew up, they flew under. Men spake and died. And we're still alive. Tell somebody nothing shakes me. When we were young, there are things that used to scare us. There are things that used to scare me when I was young. But now they don't scare me anymore. No. Why? I met God. I don't know who I'm talking to. There's a certain assurance that you get. And you say, uh uh-uh. Let whatever come may come. I don't care what they think will come. No, there's a certain assurance you can get in God. See, it's easy for God to satisfy you. It is easy for God to comfort you. When the disciples of our Lord Jesus started walking in the miraculous, the Bible says they were persecuted. And they went in the upper room. Second time, right? They locked themselves up. When they enter that room, they don't pray for God to kill their persecutors. No. They ask for boldness. Are you hearing me? They ask for what? This time around, when they lock themselves up, where are they being looked up? Look, look, I mean, uh, persecuted. Where are they uh, searching for their heads? Because they're doing miracles, signs, and wonders. So the Bible tells us they lock themselves up. And it says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak that word. And the next verse says, And by stretching forth thine hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the Holy Child, Jesus. And the next verse says, And when they had prayed, the place where there was, the Bible says, was shaken. And they assembled together. And they were all filled with another dose of the Holy Ghost. And they speak the word of God boldly. Let me tell you, if you're afraid, you just need a certain experience. Some of you might not get it. If you're afraid, you just need a certain experience. When we were growing up, men would throw threatenings, and then you go on your knees. And then they bring a person with a stage 4 cancer, and it leaves their body. <laughs> and then you say, let them talk. Why? Because they thing on me that can get cancer out of a body. I don't think it can be killed by the words of men. Great is he which is in you than he that is in the world. Hallelujah, somebody. And God is about to make you bold. Simple. He does things in your life that men can't explain. May it happen to you sooner than ever before. In the name of Jesus. May God do something. The Bible says that men shall see and fear. The Bible says God moved with Moses and men feared. May God do something in your life. That those who you fear start fearing you. (laughs) And it is possible. And it is happening. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. If you are afraid, you just need an experience. There is a certain dose of the Holy Ghost. That takes away all fear. There is a certain place of the Holy Ghost that takes away all fear. In fact, before I even continue in this service, I want to minister to people who have been struggling with fear. May the power of God separate you. May the Spirit of God come upon you. And may God do something in your life Receive it right now.
Now, not tomorrow. Start to receive it. Start to receive it. All you need is a certain dose of the Holy Ghost. There are certain things when you see them, you can never fear. There are certain things when you behold them, you will never be afraid another day. Why? Because you saw certain things. That's how God comforts us. He doesn't comfort us by patting on our backs, no. He comforts us by showing us things. Hallelujah. The Bible says the place where they were at, it started to shake. And a man said, if this thing that I've received can shake the ground, it's a small thing for a man to threaten me. May God do something in your private room. May he do something in your closet. May he do something in your prayer time. That will... In the name of Jesus. He says, you receive not the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you receive the spirit of what? Love, power, and sound mind. That is what you received. I refuse to fear. I refuse to fear. I refuse to fear. I will refuse to fear. I will not be afraid. In the name of Jesus. He says, you shall not be afraid of the terrors. The arrows. He says, a thousand shall fall at one side. And ten thousand on the right. He says, but it shall not come nigh thee. Nigh thee. Why? Because you dwell under the shadow of the Most High. All you need is a certain experience. John has the audacity to encourage men. Because his fellowship is with the Father. He says, we pray that your fellowship will be with us. Because we've seen things. We've touched things. We've tested things concerning this word of life. And those things we preach unto you that your joy may be full. Nothing takes away your joy. Why? Because the men saw God. They touched. They tested. They felt concerning the word of life. Their eyes beheld it. Their hands handled. I mean, the, when I say word, it's not physical. But they handled the word. In other words, they spoke words that became too solid. That these words started to become solid enough and become tangible with their own hands. They spoke things and they touched them. They spoke things and they showed them with their hearts. They spoke things. And they say, this is the fellowship we have with the Father. And he says, we pray that your fellowship will be with us. Why? Because our fellowship is with the Father. That's why he talks of the man which dwells in the shadow of the Most High. The Bible says, he shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High. He says, he shall abide under the shadow of the Mighty. And he says, and I shall say of my Lord. What does he say? He is my refuge and fortress. My God, he says, in him I will trust. Give me the amplified of that. Give me the amplified of that. He says, I will serve the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress. And on him I lean and rely. And in him I confidently trust. And the next verse says, for then he will he deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He says, then he will cover you with what? Pinions. And under his wings shall you trust and find refuge. His truth and his faithfulness are a shield and buckler. And you shall not be afraid. Somebody say, you shall not be afraid. Tell him you shall not be afraid. He says you shall not be afraid of the economic scale, of the rumors of war, of the, ex- uh, the, the predictions of the central bank, or of, 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 of whatever they are saying that they are saying, of the economy, of what they say that your workplace, of, of the scarcity of money and scarcity of jobs and disease and plagues. He says of the terror of the night, of the arrow, the evil plots and the slanderers of the wicked that fly by day. He says, no of the pestilences that stalks in the darkness. He says, no of the destruction, sudden death that surprises and lay waste. By the way, sudden death is a spirit. Sudden death is a spirit. And he says, you shall not be afraid of sudden death. Tell somebody, I will not have sudden death in my life. Oh, the guy was here laughing with us and then his heart stopped and then he died suddenly. That is... <laughs> the Bible speaks of people which are ever walking in the fear of death. Do you know there are people every time they're imagining dying. There are people here 
every time you imagine yourself die. You, oh, will I grow old? Oh, this disease. Oh, some of you are not even sick. The Bible speaks of them which for the fear of death were what? Were subject unto bondage. All their lifetime. I don't know whether you see that. Because you fear death, you are subject unto bondage all your life. You start, you look at your children, and then you say, Ha, ah, what if I die? <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus. Some of you, you, they call you. What's the problem? Because you expect someone either to be dead or sick. Every time you handle the phone, you expect bad news. That is a demon spirit. Be free from it. In the name of Jesus. We are going to grow old together. <laughs> Tell your neighbor and tell you what I If you're tired of me, sorry. I'm here for a long time. Somebody say amen. If you're tired of me already, you're in need for a long haul. Because I'm not going to die tomorrow. Nah, no. I'm still living and alive in the name of Jesus. He says with long life, I will satisfy you. With long life. I'm not about to die. Tell your neighbor I'm not about to die. <laughs> I have to finish. And I have to finish well. I'm not about to die. Somebody the Lord sets you free. He sets you free. From the fear of death. From the fear of death. Some of you, you examine your bodies and start saying, now, eh, I think this one can only live for five hours. Now this one, I think two minutes. No. 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 You have the life which is of God inside you. I refuse to die a normal death. I refuse to die like me, amen. No. I'll raise my children and I'll grow old and I'll see my grandchildren great grandchildren in the name of Jesus who believes it I believe it too he says you'll not fear the sudden death that surprises and lay waste at noonday Next verse is a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come near you. You must believe it. People are failing in things, money, issues, disease, divorce, things are happening. Are you hearing me? But I decree upon your life that those things shall not come nigh thee. They shall not. It shall be said that you used to hear them happen to others. Somebody say amen. amen. Not that you wish it for others. No, but you will hear them from far. That something happened from far. It shall not come nigh in the name of Jesus. May calamity stay away from your household. May it stay away from your children. May it stay away from your business. May it stay out of your education. I declare and I declare it is far from your marriage. It is far from your ministry. In the name of Jesus. Something is happening. Right now some of you are changing the course of your life. What the enemy aimed for bad. My God turns to good. For when the enemy comes in like a flood the spirit of the Lord shall raise a standard. Hallelujah. The Spirit of God has raised the standard in my finances. The Spirit of the Lord has raised the standard in my thoughts. The Spirit of the Lord has raised the standard in my marriage. He has raised the standard in my ministry. In, my, in everything that I do. When the enemy comes in like a flood. 
He says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord. That is why men who have understood this, they don't get afraid of floods. When a flood comes, they look on the Spirit. What are you up to, God? Some of you, what you're going through, in a few days, the Spirit of the Lord is going to show who you are. What you're really made of. They are going to wish they never began the war. You did every measure to avoid it. And the Spirit of the Lord will take every measure to win for you. Why? Because it is finished. We are just looking for the manifestation. But according to us who believe, it is finished. Everything you are believing God for, it is already done in the name of Jesus. And you must believe it. You must see yourself there. I don't know whether you see where I see myself. Some of you, if you started speaking where you see yourself, people would think you're just braggadocious. You are a proud, spoiled child. But what can we do? He spoiled us. The Bible says he lavishly <laughs> bestows on you. When it comes to you, God is lavish. May the man, I don't know some of you should understand this. When it comes on me, tell somebody when it comes on me, God is lavish. He does not spare. And I believe it. The joy of my salvation. That is the joy of my salvation. That is the joy of my salvation. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. There was a separation that took place in the book of Psalms 51 verses 10. That David underwent and I've seen many Christians undergo. He underwent something. And he started to tell God create in me a clean heart. And renew a right spirit within me. I want to show you something. And he told God cast me not away from thy presence. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. I hear it. Restore unto me the joy of my, thy salvation and uphold me with a free spirit. This was a man which has just, had just fallen into sin and he was separated from God because the Bible says sin disturbs relations. In the Old Testament dispensation, that was the consequence of a man in sin. There was nothing on your life. The spirit left. At least that's how they felt. You understand what I'm saying? And the joy of salvation left. And the free spirit became downcast. And he says, do not cast me out of your presence. Because there was a possibility, according to David. But one time, in that understanding of thought, David had a certain experience in God. And that understanding changed. Hallelujah. Let's open Acts 2.25. The Bible says, David speaketh concerning him. He had an experience with him. He says, I first saw the Lord always before my face. Now listen to the contrast of this. He says, for he is on my right hand. Present continuous. And I should not be moved. Huh? Has anybody got at it yet? David, there was a point in time where he was not conscious about the presence of God. And at the time when he was not conscious about the presence of God, he lost the joy of his salvation. He felt the Spirit of God lose him and leave him. He felt God go far away from him because he was a sinner. He was conscious of the sin nature. And then he lost it all. The spirit that was supposed to be free became bound. 
the man which was supposed to be happy became sad. The man which was supposed to have a joy of salvation, he, he, he lost the joy of his salvation. He started pleading with God not to cast him away from his presence. Why? Because when he was sin conscious, he received the full consequence of sin. But one day in the book of Acts, he had an experience where he became God conscious. And he says, for I, I saw the Lord always before me. That was an experience that came later. He said, I saw the Lord always before my face. For he's on my right, present continuous, that I should not be moved. And the next verse says, therefore did my heart rejoice. Why? Because the prince of God was there. And my tongue was glad. And most also, my flesh shall rest in hope. For the Bible says, because thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Next verse. And he says, Thou hast made known unto me the ways of the way. And he says, Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Why? He got the revelation of the life of God. David walked with a God of whose revelation he did not have. And so every time sin would come on his life, he was separated. He later met this God of grace. That is why he speaks of a man which is blessed. He says, blessed is the man of whom the Lord imputes not sin, but he imputes righteousness. Why? Because he saw a man who even in his own weakness, God still loved. He saw a man even in his own sin, God still cared for. He saw a man of whom the Lord would not leave, neither depart from. And he says, ah, if the Lord is always before me, my soul rests in hope. His Holy One shall not what? See corruption. Neither his soul rotting in hell. Why? Because he got of the consciousness that the Lord was ever present with him on his side. God's presence in your life is not based on your operation and your goodness. Even in your worst state, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He says, even mama, let me say something that I know is the devil. Devil, listen. He says, even when we are not faithful. He says, for law, he abides faithful. Because he cannot deny, forsake himself. He cannot deny himself. Even if you believe not. Why am I trying to tell you this? There are people who think this way. When they make a mistake. God leaves them. Then they go in church and make right. Then God comes to them. Listen. The Bible calls Jesus the propitiation of our sins. Do you know what it means? To be the propitiation. The word there for propitiation means literally the sacrifice that is enough for all. What Jesus did in your life is enough. And a man cannot dwell continuously in the presence of God until he understands the spirit of grace. That is why Paul says, And all things that were gained to me I have counted lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, for whom I count all things but down, that I may win Christ. He says, and, and, and what? Next verse. The next verse says, And, and be found in him. How is, he, how is he found in him? Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. When you understand that you're not righteous by works, but you're righteous by the faith of God, of Christ, because you believed in God. Because of that, the Bible says we have peace. Being justified freely. The Bible says we have peace. Tell somebody being justified freely. We have peace. What am I trying to tell you? Some people have put that Psalm 51 in a song. Creating me a clean heart. Oh Lord. Never seen that. God will never cast you from his presence. He will never take you away from his spirit. 
He says the spirit of God you were sealed with until the day of redemption. That's why he tells you, grieve not the spirit of God. With whom you were sealed until the day of redemption. Now you were sealed until the day you're fully out. He said he will never leave you nor forsake you. That is the joy of our salvation. Some people say, ah, now you're encouraging sin. No, I'm not encouraging sin. I'm only saying, even if there's sin in your life, I have good news for you. God is still with you and he will see you through. He will cause you to walk out and you will stand. Some people here have done the worst mistakes and they feel God left them. I have good news for you. You have made the worst mistakes but he has never left you. He's still there with you. And he still loves you. And he's going to stay with you. Until that habit leaves you. I don't know whether I'm, I'm, taking, I'm, telling, I'm talking to somebody. He is going to deal with you. You remember that story of the vine? Was it the message version? You remember that scripture? Can you remind me? Isaiah what? Where he speaks of he, he, his vine. If there's anything in it, the Bible says he shall pluck it out and still continue with it. Isaiah what? Yes. He speaks of a place where even if you have issues, he will stay with you and get those issues out and still walk with you. It is no longer an option for God to leave you. He will never leave you. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh -huh, begin from verse 3. He says, "Ah, uh, begin from verse 2. He says, at the time God will unsheath his sword, his merciless, da 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 da. Verse 2. At the same time, a fine vine will appear. There is something to sing about. I, God, do what? Tend it. I do what? Well, what? He says, I keep careful watch over it so that no one can what? Damage it. I am not angry. I what? Even if it, that vine, you, gives me thistles and thorn bushes and messes up, I'll pull them out and burn the thistles, burn the thorn bushes. And the next verse says, and what? Let that vine cling to me for safety. Let it find a good and whole life with me. Let it hold on for a good whole life. In other words, even if you've made mistakes, stay with God. Many people run away. I'm not going to church. I'm too unholy. No. You come as you are. Even if you're the worst person in the world, stay in his presence. He will pull out the thorns. He will pull out the thistles. He will pull out those silly habits. Those nasty attitudes. Those overinflated egos. He will pull out. He will pull them out. And he will still walk with you. When I met the spirit of grace. God told me one thing I will never forget. He told me grace. Whatever mistake you ever make. Never make the mistake of living my presence. That's the biggest mistake. The biggest mistake is not what you did last week. The biggest mistake is leaving the presence of Almighty God. Even with your issues, come, stay coming. Tell God you're working on me. Continue telling yourself, Where can I run? Where can I run for the presence of God? If you go to hell, he'll find you there. If you put your bed in hell, he will come there. Even there. The Bible says he's with you. You can't run away. Never run away from the presence of God. Even if you've made the worst mistake in the world. That's not the worst. The worst is running away. That's why even when Israel was running, he still kept telling them, come let us reason together. For even though your sins are as red as crimson, I will wash them as white as snow. Come and we reason. In fact, he gave an act of spirit where the man of Israel was running away from God and he kept pursuing Israel. Why? He says, even with your worst mistakes, stay in my presence. I know how to heal you. I know how to deliver you. I know how to get that nonsense out of you. Even when the thorn still abides, my grace is still sufficient. I'll get it out, but never leave the presence. Because with the presence and the Lord before you, 
you'll dwell in surety. God does not give us safety and surety because of what we've done. Remember the story of the children of Israel? When God sends a word through and he says that put blood on the doorposts and the angel of death shall come. You remember that story? And when the angel of death comes, passes through, every house that had blood, the Bible says, they were spared. And every house that had not blood, the Bible says they were what? Slain. The firstborns, right? But you all know very well by scripture. That the men in the houses with blood posts were not righteous men. They were just in the houses with blood posts. Because the blood is your safety. The word within is your surety. Did you get it? The blood without is your safety. The word within is your surety. He says we have a sure word of prophecy. The word of God gives you a surety. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask anything in my name. And it shall be what? Done. Somebody say amen. There's something about the blood of Jesus. There's something about the blood of Jesus. The Bible says you have been sanctified through his blood. You are a covenant child. There is blood on you. God sees you through the eyes of Jesus. Every time he looks at you and the blood is upon you, he looks away. Vengeance looks away. And love comes to you. And that love never fails. It will change you. It will change you. That blood will change you. That blood will change you. Why? Because the blood of Jesus is the safety point of our lives. To know that because he shed his blood for my sins, I'm under no condemnation. He says, for ye are not, Romans 8. You remember Romans 7, the end of it? He says, for what shall I do, O wicked and wretched man? Because what he wills to do, he does not. And what he wills, to, wills not to do, he does. You see what I'm saying? He says, oh wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And the next verse says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the love of God, but with the flesh the love of sin. And the next verse says, therefore, stay your neighbor, therefore. He says, now, therefore, there now, give me the Amplified. He says, there is, give me the Amplified. Therefore, there is now no condemnation, no judging and guilt of wrong for those who are in Christ Jesus, who live and walk not after the dictates of the flesh, but after the dictates of the spirit. What does it mean to walk after the dictates of the flesh? To think that you are what your flesh does. That's the Hebrew, I mean the Greek translation for walking after the dictates of the faith. You still, and then you think you're a thief. And when you think you're a thief, you continue to steal. If you have stolen one, say I'm not a thief. You'll find yourself not stealing anymore. That's walking after the spirit. Am I making sense? The next verse says, For the law of the spirit of Zoe, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being, has freed me from the law of sin and death. Somebody say amen. For God has done what the law could not do. Its power being weakened by the flesh, the entire nature of man without the Holy Spirit. He sent his own son in the guise of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. God condemned sin in the flesh. He subdued. He overcame. Deprived it of its power. Overall, who accepts that sacrifice? When you receive Jesus, sin loses its power. When you understand what the blood did, when you understand what the blood of Jesus did, sin is not a worry. It will leave you. Let me tell you, when he said he's coming for a church without spot nor wrinkle, no man in their own strength can be without spot. Even the most righteous who persecute you that you're a great preacher, even them they have sin of some kind. 
The only way God can guarantee a sinless life without spot, no wrinkle, it's through the blood. It's through the blood. There is none of us that is perfect in our own strength and abilities. But we carry a perfection by God. We ca- that is the thing the devil hates. You remember when the psalmist says, was it Psalm 103? Oh, and that way says the Bible says he has not dealt with us as according to our sin. Was verse three? One or three? Verse ten. He says, For he, he says, Forgiveth all our iniquities. He says, He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our own iniquities. Next verse. He says, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. Somebody say amen. Next verse. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Listen, God has not dealt with us according to our sin. Why do we deal with men according to their sin? Do you understand what I'm saying? If God has not dealt with us according to our sin, why do we deal with men according to their sin? Our business is not to judge. Our business is to love men and allow God to work in their lives. If there's anything to fix in the dear sister with her random attitude, let her alone. The Lord will deal with her. I have walked this life of the Spirit for so long and I have met the most ultimate surprises of the life of God. There are people I saw a couple of years ago and they looked too straight to fall. And there are people I saw who looked too fallen to be straightened. Over the years, them which looked fallen to be straightened now are too straightened to fall. And they which looked like they were too straight to fall are now too fallen to be straightened. I remember many years there is somebody who messed us up in the ministry. And somebody advised me and they told me, chase this person out of the church. Because this person kept doing the same things you tell her, she does the same things you tell her, then she does the same things, then you tell her, then she does, then you tell her, now this time, I swear, then you tell her, then, nah, then, nah. and then they told me, but uh, there is something, it's as if you're promoting, no, I told them I'm not promoting. But I remember telling one person who was driving somewhere, I told them, look, I just feel she will change. I don't know when. But she will change. And I've been with this person for close to five years. And now I look at them. And I'm like, God, you change me. And the people who want me on her. They left. And I've heard some have fallen off the face. If you look at people with the eyes of men, you can lose something precious. Let me tell you, there is something precious even in the worst person in this world. Never stop believing in people until God tells you move on. There are some God will tell you this one, move on. And it's not that God has left them. It only means that they are not your responsibility. Another one will help them. <laughs> Woo! Did you hear what I say? Another one will what? They are not for the grace on you to help them. But never stop believing in men. Some of you, you've been losing the joy of your salvation. Why? Because when you make a mistake, you start feeling, ah, oh, I think God has left me. He'll never talk to me again. <laughs> These things we write unto you that your joy may be full. The reason why those men were happy was very simple. They had a fellowship with the Father. What does that mean? He says they were constantly in his word. That's what fellowship is. They understood the spirit of grace. 
He says, those that the Father has given me, I shall by no means cast out. God cannot cast out whom God, I mean Jesus cannot cast out whom God has what? Given him. And he will never cast you out. Some of you are doing things for Jesus to leave you. Sorry, he's not going to leave you. He will love you and love you and love you until you say, okay, okay, I surrender, I'm tired. Then you close your zip. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because he loves you that much. I don't worry about a man who has known grace. They will walk out. Regardless of how bad it is, you will walk out. Regardless of how bad it appears, you will walk out. Out. One day you'll be the other side and men will be saying, wow, this guy changed. Wow. This, why? Because everything that you need to change you has already been finished. It's too late not to go to heaven. Surely goodness and anger and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. Amen. Why do they dwell in the house of the Lord? Because goodness and mercy follows them. The moment judgment comes, they walk out. The children of Israel, every time God lashed at them, they rebelled more. The more he lashed at them, the more he, they rebelled more. The more with loving kindness he came toward them, he drew them. Men don't change because of anger. You can burn them still. Put them to stake. They will not change. Men change through love. Love can change anybody. First Corinthians 13 says, Love never fails. How then does a man dwell constantly in the presence? Simple. Embrace the spirit of grace. Understand you don't go there because of what you did. And you're not going to get a result in the presence of God because of what you did. No. You're going to go there because of what he did. And you're going to get results because of what he did. He says, come to the throne of grace with what? Bold. Come boldly to the throne of what? Grace. That you may obtain mercy. How do you obtain mercy? By coming boldly. Don't come timid. Because you'll attract wrath. It means you don't believe in the oracles. It means your fellowship with God is not by revelation. No. Come boldly unto the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Men who go to God boldly, there's a way God clears them out and sorts them for good. Men who go timid, what does fear do? Fear attracts more torment. Many of you are suffering a number of tormentations because you have the spirit of fear. Listen, God loves you. Somebody say amen. In other words, you will never lose the joy of your salvation. I don't, I'm not telling you don't lose it. I'm telling you, after this understanding, you will never lose the joy of your salvation. Even with your worst mistakes, you're still born again. He loves you. And you'll wash that nonsense out and foolishness and still walk with you. So if you believe it, shout amen. Now I want you to thank God for his love. Jesus Christ, I think about your sacrifice. You became nothing. Pour out today. Many times I've wondered at your gift of life. I'm in once again I am in the place once again once again once again I look upon the cross where you died I humble Once again, thank 
tonight in a minute and say God I receive everything that has been shared tonight thank you for not leaving me when I made mistakes thank you for believing in me when I screwed up thank you for staying on my side even when I was not perfect thank you for working in me even when I didn't deserve thank you for not dealing with me even when my sin deserved thank you for your presence thank you for loving me and no doubt by this love I will not fail in Jesus name somebody stand up the message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International for more information contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest. Thank you.